Hi guys, welcome back to part two of the Rapid Neurology Ophthalmology series. In this part, we're going to cover extradural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we're going to cover the Glasgow Coma Scale. But before we start, we're going to go back to our three question warm up. Question one someone comes into you with bilateral dilated pupils with a weak response to light but a really strong response to near. What could that be? Number two, someone comes in with a unilateral dilated pupil antosis. And number three, unilateral constricted pupil antosis. Write down your answers, pause the video, and let's get back to it. So guys, the answer to number one is Holmes pupil. We'll cover that in the fourth part of the series. Number two, dilated pupil antosis. That's a third nerve palsy. Now remember, there is surgical causes, such as a posterior communicating artery aneurysm, and there's medical causes more commonly, such as atherosclerosis. Again, part four video of the of the series will cover all of these. And number three, ptosis and a constricted pupil is Horner syndrome. So remember the four segments of Horner syndrome are ptosis, meiosis, amhydrosis, and enophthalmus. Great, now let's get back to the video. So the first condition we're going to cover here is extradural hemorrhage. Now extradural hemorrhage, if you know the layers of the head, you'll be able to understand these hemorrhage as well. So we start off with the skull, that's the outermost layer, followed by the dura. Now the space between the skull and the dura is the extradural space. Now the dura and the arachnoid, that's the second layer. The space between the dura and the arachnoid is the subdural space. And finally, between the arachnoid and the pia, the space between those is the subarachnoid space. So if you have an extradural hemorrhage, it's a hemorrhage between the skull and between the dura. Now, why do we get extradural hemorrhages? Well, usually they happen in young people, and it's because we have the middle meningeal artery running really, really superficially to a bone called the terion. Now, this is the thinnest bone of the skull. So any trauma to the terion, this area right here, will cause a bleed and injury to this middle meningeal artery. How do these patients present? Well, these patients present with something called a lucid interval. First of all, they have the trauma that's really key to the history. They lose consciousness and after a few minutes, they gain consciousness again and they're fully okay, apart from a headache. A few hours later, they lose consciousness again and they could die. This is called the lucid interval. Now, what other signs could you find in these patients? Well, you could have things like false localizing signs. What are those? False localizing signs such as a third nerve palsy and that's because there's uncle herniation pressing on that third nerve. The other thing is you could get a sixth nerve palsy from increased intracranial pressure because the sixth nerve has a very long course throughout the brain. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we need to do if the GCF drops below 8 is we need to intubate that patient. The second thing is you really need to get a CT scan to find out exactly what it is. You find a biconvex shape as seen on the image right there. Okay, so the second disease we're going to cover is subdural hemorrhage. And if you pause the video once again and write down where it covers, Yes, it's right between the arachnoid and the dura, that's the subdural space. Why does this happen? Well, the, that space, the subdural space, actually shouldn't exist in young people. But as the brain atrophies, as you get older, that space becomes created. You get some very weak bridging veins that minor trauma, even going to the hairdresser and shaking your head, can cause bleeding in these things. Usually the history is a little bit chronic, although there are types of acute subdural hemorrhage, and the patient will present with progressive loss of memory or confusion or headaches. That's how these patients present. How do you diagnose them? You do a CT scan and it will find a crescent shaped hemorrhage. The third type of hemorrhage is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, subarachnoid hemorrhage happens between the pia and the arachnoid. Why does it happen? The most common cause is actually trauma. The second most common cause or non traumatic cause are usually aneurysms. And the most common place for that within the circle of Willis is the anterior communicating artery. How does this present? Well, I have a video right here about the presentation of headaches once again. And one of these is subarachnoid hemorrhage, but really it's that thunderclap headache, that kick in the back of the head that, that the patients have, and they could lose consciousness. And because the bleeding is within the meninges, between the pia and the arachnoid, people get next difference, the signs of meningism that we talked about within meningitis. So what do we do again? We get a CT scan, we find that's subarachnoid hemorrhage. How do we treat a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, you need very tight blood pressure control. You don't want the blood pressure to be skyrocketing, but also you want to perfuse the brain and the blood pressure can't be too low. We use things like labetalol to try and control the blood pressure, IV labetalol. The other thing you can do is if there is a hydrocephalus, you want to put a ventricular vertical shunt to try and decompress that. And finally, what you want to do is you want to refer to the interventional radiologist to see if they can clip that aneurysm or not. 
All right, lastly, in this video, we're going to talk about Glasgow Coma Scale. This is very important, and lots of questions come up about Glasgow Coma Scale during your finals examination or during your medical school examination or the plan. What are the Glasgow Coma Scale? Well, it's three scores. There's motor, there's verbal, so speech, and there's eyes. Now, you only have two eyes. Two times two is four, so the eye scores out of four. The minim minimum score you can get in a Glasgow Coma Scale is three. So if someone doesn't open their eyes at all, if someone doesn't speak or produce any sounds, and if someone doesn't make any movements in response to pain, in response to anything, they get a three, one, one, and one. If someone opens their eyes spontaneously, then they get a four. If someone is talking like I'm talking spontaneously, they get a, they get a five. And if someone is moving around everywhere as they wish, they get six. And the scores go back little by little, and I've got the slides right here in front of you, and I'll give you an example. Okay, so my example here is this 24-year-old guy, he's a boxer, he gets punched in the head, loses consciousness, and wakes up again after a few hours. Then he loses consciousness again. You assess him, and you find out that when you, when you put pain on him, he produces incomprehensible sounds, he opens his eyes to that pain, and he abnormally flexes. What score does he get? Again, pause the video, write it down. Okay, so he gets a 2 for opening his eyes to pain, he gets a 2 for producing incomprehensible sounds, and he gets a 3 for doing abnormal flexion, so he gets a score of 2, 2, 4, and 3, so he gets a score of 7. Now, what does this patient suffer from? Well, he suffers from an extradural hemorrhage because of a middle meningeal artery bleed. How do we treat this patient? It's Glasgow Coma Scale is 7, what's the first thing we need to do? Well, you need to intubate the patient because you need to make sure that his airway doesn't collapse. Okay guys, that's the end of the video. I hope this was useful for you. If there's anything I missed or anything you want me to go in more detail, please let me know. And let's end this series by three more questions. What is the vessel that is affected in subdural hemorrhage? Yes, that's the bridging veins. Which artery is affected in a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, it's the anterior communicating artery. And which artery is affected in an extradural hemorrhage? Yes, that is the middle meningeal artery. Okay guys, so make sure you check in for part three of the series next week. If you have any questions, once again, please leave them down. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Thank you.